Good morning, everybody. As you can see from the program, the title of my presentation is The Threat of a Religious Right-Wing Supreme Court Abolishing Secular Government. This time, I mean it. <laughs> and this is for those of you who have heard me flailing on this issue for over 20 years. There is a subtitle, though, to this talk, which is, this is the presentation I hoped I would never have to make. But we're going to have to deal with a harsh reality. We're going to have to deal with the reality that the change of just one more vote on the Supreme Court could usher in a theocracy. It could result in atheists, members of minority religions, members of the LGBTQ community, all of us being officially shunted into second-class citizenship. One more Trump appointee to the Supreme Court, and for the first time ever, there will be five definite votes to abolish government neutrality in matters of religion. For the first time ever, all branches of government will then be permitted to openly favor belief over non-belief. Exactly 70 years ago this year, the United States Supreme Court announced what is the true meaning of separation of church and state. And they did so in a way that even though we have come perilously close to losing it, we never did up until what we are facing currently. The court said in the Everson case, the establishment of religion clause of the First Amendment means at least this, neither a state nor the federal government can set up a church, neither can pass laws which aid one religion, aid all religions, or prefer one religion over another. Neither can force nor influence a person to go to or to remain away from church against one's will, or force one to profess a belief or disbelief in any religion. No person can be punished for entertaining or professing religious beliefs or disbeliefs for church attendance or non-attendance. No tax in any amount, large or small, can be levied to support any religious activities or institutions, whatever they may be, be called, or whatever form they may adopt to teach or practice religion. Neither a state nor the federal government can openly or secretly participate in the affairs of any religious organization or groups and vice versa. In the words of Jefferson, the clause against establishment of religion by law was intended to erect a wall of separation between church and state. The majority opinion, Everson versus Board of Education, 330 United States Reports at pages 15 and 16, 1947. And now, 70 years later, we are on the brink of losing this. The court also held again repeating this in 05, the government may not favor one religion over another or religion over irreligion, religious choice being the prerogative of individuals. If Trump succeeds in replacing only one, let alone both, of either Ginsburg or Kennedy, there will be this new majority for the first time ever. And what we are facing is a chilling dissent by Justice Scalia now reaching out from the grave to finally become the majority law of the land. And what will surprise even many of my brother and sister atheists is that in the most sweeping language that Scalia ever wrote to talk about the nullification of church-state separation, he spoke about exclusion not just of us non-believers, but also exclusion of believers in religions that don't have a unified single deity. In 05, in a dissent, he wrote, the principle that government cannot favor religion over irreligion is demonstrably false. And here is language that would exclude all of us from protection by our precious First Amendment. And I quote, it is entirely clear from our nation's historical practice that the Establishment Clause permits 
the disregard of polytheists, believers and unconcerned deities, just as it permits the disregard of devout atheists. This is unconscionable. How can anybody in America be excluded from full legal equality because of either accepting or rejecting any tenet of religious faith? So what Scalia is saying is that if his view prevails, which means if one more justice joins Roberts, Alito, Thomas, and Gorsuch, there will now be five votes to implement this, and not only will we be second-class citizens, not only will the religious be able to discriminate against anybody, particularly retargeting the LGBTQ community in addition to non-believers, but also those recognized minority religions that are not classically monotheistic, their members will also face equal discrimination. It means government at all levels will be able to openly push belief over non-belief and we will have a theocracy. We don't know how far that will go. Will it just mean that government can come out and say God exists, atheists are wrong? In addition to prayer in schools, does it mean that atheists could be discriminated against if we want to seek loans for our homes? To what extent will the Supreme Court allow overt discrimination against us if it adopts the view that we atheists are no longer to be regarded by the First Amendment. Neil Gorsuch, the newest justice on the court, is even worse than Scalia in this regard. I know it's a little bit technical in the legal sense, but it's important for all of us to understand. 20 years ago, I was invited back to my law school, Loyola Law School, to meet Scalia, and we had a conversation. And I asked him, I said, Your Honor, what is to happen with things like abortion, right of assisted suicide? He said, actually, people misunderstand me. I don't oppose those things. I just believe there's no right to them, which is bad enough from our perspective. But if the states want to allow them, that's fine. Gorsuch wrote a book on assisted suicide 10 years ago where he said, even if the states want to allow it, it's impermissible because under the 14th Amendment, you cannot, by even state legislative majority, vote to end life. So Gorsuch is more extreme than Scalia in his views on what the religious right can do. Whereas I've heard Scalia say many times that if you want abortion, just have the state legislature pass a pro-choice law. We don't know what Gorsuch will do. Now, if a vacancy occurs on the court before there is a change of political party control of the Senate, it is more likely than not that Trump will be able to secure a religious right-wing majority on the court. This is the first time that I'm going to be offering to my brother and sister atheists at this convention, suggested efforts and approaches that may not work, but it's all we can do. It's all we can do. Let me say that the fight to preserve the separation of church and state, the fight to make sure that we atheists do not become second-class citizens by a reconstituted Supreme Court is so important that it's a battle we have to wage even if we ultimately lose. So what do we do if a vacancy occurs, if Kennedy retires in June, and even if there is a new Senate majority, it does not take office until January of 19? We have to have our people in every state contact their senators and try to get them to vote against a religious right-wing nominee. Even if we were to get the two moderates, Senators Lisa Murkowski of Alaska and Susan Collins of Maine, 
we would still need one more defector because Vice President Pence can cast a tie-breaking vote. Under the new rules of the Senate, a mere majority can now confirm a Supreme Court nominee. It doesn't have to be a two-thirds majority. We will then have to undertake a nationwide effort to make coalitions with people that some of us may not otherwise agree with. Dave Silverman was absolutely right this morning that we must exclude white supremacists and bigots. But he was very, very right a few years ago when he went to the conservative political action committee meeting to try to persuade secular conservatives that they need to abandon the religious right. Also, though we are nonpartisan and we don't endorse or oppose candidates, speaking generally, nothing is more important to the future of the Supreme Court which is inextricably intertwined with our future as atheists, our future as members of any religious viewpoint minority. And that is, we must achieve a United States Senate that will reject a religious right-wing nominee. As of today, we have a religious right-wing favoring Senate that will confirm the worst Trump nominee. So if the Senate is not altered in its composition in next year's midterm elections, there will be absolutely nothing we can do to prevent a clear majority of religious right-wing Supreme Court justices from destroying our freedoms for at least 40 years. So any kind of activism, any kind of political involvement must have that laser beam target of shifting the current composition of the United States Senate because there is nothing else that we will be able to do to stop a Supreme Court that will now be riddled with far religious right-wing justices. I know this is horrible news. I know this is something that is more challenging and ominous than anything we have ever faced as atheist activists. But it is a battle that we must wage. Now, what do we do in the event that we lose the Supreme Court and a new ruling adopts Scalia's view that every branch of government can favor believers over non-believers and that believers may discriminate in their dealings with the general public against people who violate the tenets of the individual's religions. What do we do if it's now possible for restaurant owners to refuse to seat gay people or to refuse to seat atheists? What do we do if a bank says, I'm not going to make you this loan because you're an atheist and the Supreme Court says and the state legislature says that even though it's overtly discriminatory, we are no longer a protected class of people? What we do is we must undertake lobbying in the legislatures of each of the 50 states. I know it's disheartening, but we have no choice. Also, as I have been haranguing this convention for every year since I first spoke in 2002, we must start to elect our own people to state legislatures around the country. Also, to the extent that the United States has submitted itself to the jurisdiction of the World Court in The Hague, we will have to bring actions there claiming human rights violations if people are subjected 
to loss of civil rights in this country merely because of non-belief. All of these things will have to be undertaken if we lose the Supreme Court. It is overdue for us to run for school boards, but it is even more overdue for us to start populating state legislatures. But I have to emphasize that nothing is more important than the composition of the United States Senate. Because the United States Senate can give the president any justice he wants. And there's no way around this. So let's make sure we understand what we have to do. We have to try to change the composition of the Senate next year. Failing that, we have to have a broad-based coalition of libertarians, conservatives, people of all walks of life who are not Nazis or white supremacists. We have to gather them and try, as Dave has so courageously done with the Conservative Political Action Committee, to reject the religious right. And our message to mainstream conservatives is that if you believe in limited government, you should reject the religious right. <laughs> if we fail to defeat the next religious right wing nominee who gives Trump the majority for the religious right and the Supreme Court starts to erode our liberties, we must then turn to the state legislatures, lobby there, and get our own people elected. If we fail in all of these endeavors, we do not give up. There is a real chance, my precious brother and sister atheists, that all of us in this room will live to see some form of theocracy in America because of Donald Trump's ability to remake the Supreme Court. We can't sugarcoat this. We can't dodge the reality of the numbers on the court. But we can pledge, in Jefferson's words, our lives and our fortunes to making sure that someday there will once again be an America where nobody suffers any loss of their freedom because of either accepting or rejecting any tenet of religious faith. Let's begin the struggle now and let us be forevermore the true patriots of the First Amendment. Thank you.